Hello, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Shenzhen. Thanks for your time to attend the TMS training course today. My name is Brandon, and I'm going to present you the TMS application in stroke rehabilitation. First, I will introduce you a case study. The patient's name is Karen. Let us look at the patient profile. She is 27 years old and she works at a local bank as a clerk. Like many young people nowadays, she works hard and parties hard. But sports is not her cup of tea. She and junk food see eye to eye. She felt time is not always not enough for her and found herself sleep very late. So one day she awoke and found herself couldn't get up. Half of her body was paralyzed and numb. She can't talk or move. I can tell you now that she had a stroke. You might be wondering why she had stroke at such early age. Well, st statistically, stroke now became more common in young adults. In 2019, the top 10 causes of death accounted for 55% of the 55.4 million deaths worldwide. Well, if you notice any signs or symptoms of stroke, do not hesitate to ask to seek medical attention. Call your local emergency number right away. Every minute counts. The longer a stroke goes untreated, the greater potential for brain damage and uh, disability. Well, Karen was sent to hospital by an ambulance. The treatment actually starts in the ambulance. The emergency workers will collect valuable information that guides treatment and alert hospital medical staff before Karen arrive at the emer emergency room. Well, <clears throat> doctor will give Karen emergency aid and surgery. First, they run multiple tests and the physical checks to diagnose, which may include physical examinations, patient to determine patient symptoms, medical history, blood pressure, and the blood vessels at the back of eyes are checked. Second, blood test to find out time taken for clotting the blood. Third, CT scan. Images of brain can show a hemorrhage, hemorrhage, tumor, stroke, or other medical conditions. Ultrasound to check the blood flow in the corroded arteries and to check for plague, if any. MRI, magnetic resonance Im imaging. MRI of brain tissue to diagnose ischemic stroke or brain hemorrhages. Well, echocardiogram to check for any sources of clots that could have traveled to the brain and lead to stroke. Normally, there are two main causes of stroke. A blocked artery, which is ischemic stroke, or leaking or bursting of a blood vessel, which is hemorrhagic stroke. Some people may have only a temporary disruption of blood flow to the brain. This is known as a transient ischemic attack, TIA, which doesn't cause lasting symptoms. Well, ischemic stroke made up about 80% of stroke cases in an ischemic stroke, parts of brain are starved of oxygen and nutrition. When blood vessels become blocked, 
brain cells will be damaged and begin to die. There are two different ways that could cause ischemic stroke. The first one is arterial thrombosis, also called thrombotic stroke or cerebral thrombosis. This is when a blood clot throm thrombus forms in an artery supplying your brain and clots the blood supply. The second one is cerebral embolism. This is when a blood clot forms somewhere else in your body, usually in your heart or one of the largest or one of the large arteries that supply it travels to your brain and blocks the blood supply. Here are some pictures that will show you the, the process of ischemic stroke. First, astrochloric plague reduce blood flow in the internal carotid artery. Second, if the, if the plague ruptures, tiny pieces of plague and clotted blood can travel in the bloodstream to the brain. The, a foreign mass travel, traveling through the bloodstream is called an embolus. If it lodges in a small artery, blood will be blocked. As you can see here, brain tissues affected by blockage, it already starved, uh, starved without uh, oxygen and nutrition. Well, your brain controls everything your body does, including your movement, speech, vision, and emotions. Damage to it can affect any of these functions. The second stroke is hemorrhagic stroke. It re results from a weakened vessel that ruptures and blood and bleeds into the surrounding brain. The blood accumulates and compresses the sur surrounding brain tissue. The two types of hemorrhagic strokes are subarachnoid hemorrhage and the intracerebral hemorrhage. Subraca hemorrhage occurs when a blood vessel on the surface of the brain ruptures and bleeds into the space between the brain and the skull. Intracerebral hemorrhage occurs when a blood vessel bleeds into the tissue deep within the brain. The two types vacant blood vessel usually cause the hemorrhagic stroke. The one is aneurysm and uh, another is AVM, arterial venous malformations. Here are some pictures that will show you the process. Well, cerebral artery aneurysm can cause subarachnoid bleeding. And a small arterial ruptures and bleeds into the brain tissues. So here is an example of cerebral artery aneurysm, and this is when it ruptures. So after the diagnosis, then it will come to acute, acute treatment. Now, emergency treatment for stroke depends on whether you are having an ischemic stroke or a stroke that involves bleeding into the brain. Therapies with drugs well, therapies with drugs that can break up a clot has to be given within 4.5 hours from when the symptoms first started, if given properly. The the sooner these drugs are given, the better. 
quick treatment not only improves your chances of survival, but also may reduce complications. Well, tissue plasminogen act activator, TPA, will be given to patients, which acts as, acts as a symbolic, a clot-busting drug to break up blood clots. TPA improves the chances of recovering from stroke. Study shows that patients with is ischemic stroke who receive TPA are more likely to recover fully or have less disability than patients who do not receive the drug. Patients treat, treated with TPA are also less likely to need long-term care in a nursing home. Well, doctors sometimes treat ischemic stroke directly inside the blocked blood vessel. It can be used for people with large clots that can't be completely dissolved with TPA. Well, for hemorrhagic stroke, it mainly controls the bleeding and reduces the blood pressure. Medi medications will be given to lower the blood in your brain and lower the blood pressure, prevent spasm of blood vessel and prevent seizures. If the area of bleeding is large, doctors may perform surgery to remove the blood and relieve brain pressure. Surgery may be also be used to repair blood vessel problem associated with hem hemorrhagic stroke. The second is surgical clipping. A surgeon places a tiny clamp at the base of aneurysm to stop the blood flow to it. This clamp can keep the aneurysm from bursting, or it can keep an aneurysm that has recently hemorrhaged from bleeding again. The third is a surgical AVM removal. Surgeons may remove a smaller AVM if it's not if it's located in an accessible area of your brain. This eliminates the risk of rupture and lowers the risk of hemorrhagic stroke. However, it's not always possible to remove an AVM if it's located deep within the brain. If it's, it's large or its removal could cause too much of an impact of brain function. Well, when the acute treatment phase was over, then it will come to rehabilitation phase. So, why do we need post-stroke rehabilitation? The disability that a person with stroke experiences and the rehabilitation that is needed depends on the size of brain injury and the particular brain circuits that are damaged. The brain has an intrinsic ability to rewire its circuits after a stroke, which leads to some degree of improved function over months to years. Even though rehabilitation does not reverse brain damage, it can sustain, substantially help a stroke survivor achieve the best long-term outcome. Well, certain symptoms could appear after the, a stroke, such as hand motor dysfunction, lower limb motor dysfunction, dysphagia, aphasia, neglect, central post-stroke pain, depression after stroke. So I'm going to present you some literature of application under these scenarios. It needs to be mentioned here that Every literature I'm going to present is from 2019 Europe, Europe guideline for TMS. So, case one, TMS treatment for upper limb dysfunction in subacute stroke. So the title is done here and you can see in 
a double blind random randomized control trial. 112 patients with hemiplegia after stroke were randomly divided into two groups, experimental and control. In experimental groups, the patients receive uh, LFRTMs and VR training treatment, and those in control group receive sham RTMS and VR training treatment. Participants in both groups received the therapy of six days per week for four weeks. The primary endpoint include the upper limb motor function test of Fugelmeyer assessment and the wolf motor function test. The secondary endpoint including modified MBI and the 36 item short form health survey questionnaire or assessed before and four weeks after the treatment. The treatment protocol was right here. So after four weeks treatment, the UFMA scores, WMFT scores were significantly increased in the experimental group as compared with the control group. The results suggested that the combined of the combined use of LFRTMS with VR training could effectively improve the upper limb function, the living activity and the quality of life in patients with hemiplegia following subacute stroke, which may provide a better rehabilitation treatment for subacute stroke. Well, case number two, TM TMS treatment for lower limb dysfunction. A total of 24 patients with average Fugelmeyer lower limb scores of 17 and average walking speed of 63 were randomized into an experiment group and a control group. Participants received RTMS or sham TMS, followed by task oriented training, which is 30 minutes for 10 sessions over two weeks. RTMS was applied at a one, one hertz frequency over the leg area of the motor cortex of the unaffected hemisphere for 10 minutes. So the outcome is including motor evoked potential, lower extremity Fugelmeyer score and the gait performance. They were measured before and after training. We can look at the, the result here. Decrease the interhemispheric asymmetry of the amplitude of the MEP was noted after RTM, RTMS and the task oriented training. Improvement in spatial asymmetry of gait was comparable with increased symmetry in interhemispheric excitability. Motor control and walking ability were also significantly improved after RTM, RTMS and task-oriented training. So it reached a conclusion that RTMS enhanced the effect of task-oriented training in those with chron chronic stroke, especially by increasing gained spatial symmetry and uh, corti cortical motor excitability symmetry. So case number three, TMS treatment for dysphagia.
this is also a randomized uh, a sham control double blind study. It con conducted to in investigate the effects of high frequency versus low frequency RTMS on patients with post stroke dysphagia during early rehabilitation. Here is the treat treatment protocol. 40 patients with post-stroke dysphagia were randomized to receive five daily sessions of sham 3 hertz ipsilegional or 1 hertz control lesional RTMS. Swallowing function, the severity of stroke and the function disability. Cortical excitability were examined before. Immediately, immediately after five daily sessions, as well as first, second, third months after the last session. We can see from here, at baseline, no significant differences between groups were ob observed in terms of demographic and the clinical rating scales. However, a significantly greater improvement in swelling function as well as functional disability was observed after real T RTMS when compared with sham TMS. It will also remain three months after the end of treatment sessions. In addition, one hertz RTMS increased the cortical excitability of the affected hemisphere and decreased that of the non-affected hemisphere. The conclusion is that RTMS, both high and low frequency, improves swollen recovery in patients with post-stroke dysphagia, and the effects could last for at least three months. So, case number four. I will only present the conclusion. They established a real-time model that involved implementing verbal tasks with the RTMS protocol. Uh, the results confirm that the strategy yielded favorable outcomes that were of considerable longevity. The results was also indicates that RTM protocol and the language training can be combined to achieve outcomes superior to those obtained when used separately. Then after the physical treatment, Karen was sent home to recover with his family. So step by step, she gradually fully recovered from the stroke. That's all for my presentation today. If you want to learn more info on TMS, please follow us on our social media platform. Thanks.